Egyptians and technology do not work together, I can tell you that much. Um, thank you for having me this morning. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here in the church, and I thank Arlene and Pastor Phil for always opening their home for me and for the Prescute Church. So I had a debate this morning with myself. Do I give a ceremony? Do I give like just a teaching? Or do I speak with you about what's happening around the world today, especially in the Middle East, and, and how it's affecting the American people and how it's affecting uh, not just the Prescute Christians, but even the view of what's happening in our country, in Canada or United States, from this administration. And I decided that I will just share my heart with you. I will not give the ceremony. My ceremony was under the name, Are You Angry Enough? It was based on Psalm 4. And just a few hours before I come here, the Lord said, No, change it. I don't like when he do that. <laughs> Let's start the story from the beginning. The situation in the Middle East. How many of you hear this expression, Arab Spring? Raise your hands up if you hear this expression in your media, Arab Spring. Arab Spring is a name was given by this American administration for the revolution that taking place in the Middle East. So they called it Arab Spring. And I can guarantee to you that whoever gave it this name, he was a man sitting behind his desk wearing his suit, doesn't even know where is the Middle East on the map. I promise you that. But let's start the story from the beginning. So you have a dictatorship. So from Libya, Gaddafi in Libya, you have Ali Abdullah Saleh of Yemen, you have Bashar al-Assad in Syria, you have Mubarak in Egypt, you have Zain al-Abidin in Tunis. All of these countries have a dictatorships. We all against dictatorships, make no mistakes. We all here against dictatorships. We hate dictatorships. But the problem in the Middle East, when you take a dictatorship out, you create a political vacuum. Who is using this political vacuum is the extremist. Is the Muslim extremist. And we saw this happen by the taking over by the Muslim Brotherhood in many of these countries, all of these countries, in a matter of fact. Except Syria. There is still fight and a battle going on. And when the Muslim extremists took over, the first victim was the Christians. So the Arab Spring turned to be a cold, deadly winter on the minorities. And not only the Christians, the target is also Israel. And we'll be speaking about these two different groups, what's happening. So we need to understand that the Arab Spring is turned to be a cold, deadly winter on the minority. That's how we see it right now. But the truth and the reality that you cannot, our media, our Canadian media or our American media, project this Arab Spring as a good thing. Oh, the Middle East and the Muslim people finally will have democracy. Are you kidding me? You cannot have democracy between day and night. You just can't. It's as simple as that. If we talk about the Egyptian society for a second, you have 30 to 40 percent of the Egyptians is illiterate. They don't know how to write and read their own name. So even if you reform the constitution, even if you reform the constitution, they don't know what they are voting on. So education has to come before democracy. Without education, democracy dies. Education is the oxygen of democracy, and this is the reality. There will never be a democracy in the Middle East without implementing two elements. Number one is the freedom of, re of religion. The separation, number two, is the separation between the religion and the state. You have to have a separation between the religion and the state. Any religion, any state, trust me on this one. And the freedom of religion, as we said. And freedom of religion have to be you are free to believe in whatever you want to believe. And I don't force you to follow me. 
you are free even if you don't want to believe. If you don't want to believe in anything, hey, that's your loss. Man is not mine. I don't care. It's between you and God. It's not between me and you. I share with you a story. Um, that's a true story. That's not a joke. Our first international conference was in Jerusalem. And we had Canadian member of parliament. We uh, had um, the minister of immigration. We have, uh, in Canada, we have ministers. Y here you have a secretary of blah 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 in, in Canada we have in Canada we have ministers so we have the minister of immigration and he came with us and it was a big conference and we met with the Israeli foreign affairs minister we met with the head of the Israeli parliament the Knesset we met with the mayor of Jerusalem it was a big deal and in the middle of in the middle of all of, and the media of course because I'm Egyptian guy so why an Egyptian guy coming to support Israel so it, it, it was really big in the media I love to be brown. Seriously, I just won't say that. <laughs> and the media just went crazy and everything. And one uh, group came to us in the conference. That's a true story. I'm not joking. And he said, we want to be partner with you. I was like, man, I don't even know you. No, we want to be partner with you. We are also minority. I told them, minority, minority from where? California. You're a minority in California in what sense? I'm, I'm really not understanding. I'm trying to get the full story. And I learned not to judge anything. The people from California is weird. You have to admit. I don't know if it's the orange juice. I don't know if it's too much sun. I don't know what's the situation there. But anyway. So I, I have no idea, man. So I, I told him, what do you mean you're a minority? He said, well, a group of people that we believe that God is a woman. I told him, listen, look it. I will not discriminate against you. You want to attend the conference, you are free to attend the conference. You want to worship in whatever way, please, you are free. But to become a partner with me, I don't need your partnership. I'm good in my own, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, you are, and here you go. I will allow you to come to the conference for free. I will, you are allowed to worship however you want to like to worship. I will not discriminate against you. You come in. Welcome. Our home is open. And the guy started pushing, like, for me to believe in what he wants to believe. And he's really like, and he got on my nerve. And it's not like nerves, it's nerve. Don't touch it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> no, I'm saying, you know, I am this age in my life that I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to be cranky. You understand what I mean? Like, I'm, like in the old days, I would be like, hey, you know, and I'm, I'm 36, I'm getting old, man, I'm cranky don't touch it. You know what I mean? So he got on my nerve, not nerves, nerve. And he said, I need to know why you don't believe in what we believe. I told him, look it. Here it goes. Here it comes. I told him, there is two reasons why I don't believe that God is a woman. Number one, I believe that God is a holy being. He's not male or female. I think it's limit limiting God. God is not a male or female. And I refuse the idea that God is a man or God is a woman. It's a symbol of that. I told him, second, if God is a woman, all men will go to hell and we'll never know why. <laughs> half of you who laughed, you know that I'm saying the truth. The another half, I didn't laugh. You are scared of your partner, you coward. <laughs> that, that's true story. That's not a joke. Freedom of religion is to believe or not to believe in whatever you want, but not to force anybody else to follow your beliefs. The truth and the reality that today, what really shocking to me. It's not the persecution of the Christians in the Middle East. It's not burning their churches. It's not killing them. Believe it or not, it's a metal of honor to be tortured for Christ's sake. Believe it or not. Last year, I received the, um, I don't know what they call it, a Diamond Jubilee. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a metal from the Queen of England. Uh, Canada is part of the British Commonwealth, so we're still under the 
queen kind of a deal. And really, we don't know who she is. I, all what I know, we have no relationship with the queen whatsoever. The only thing we have her face on the $20. That's the only thing that we have. Anyway. So I received the Medal of Honor from the Queen of England, not from her personally, but from, from the government of Canada. And the minister, when he was giving it to me, he told me, this is your first medal. I told him, no, sir, this is my third. He said, what's the first? I told him, believing in Christ my salvation. That's my first medal. He told me what's the second. I told him the scars that I have from torture for him. And this is the third one. I tried to sell it on eBay, but it was $40 only. But anyway, that's another story. (laughs) But the truth and the reality that this was not the surprising part. When you go to Syria and you see the churches is is destroyed and and the killing all the way from Iraq to Syria to Egypt to Libya that's not uh, to Tunis now that's not the surprising part the surprising part when you have a western leader like this American administration can I be not politically correct with, can, can I just speak honestly like with you know, we all one family aren't we can we speak honestly and really, I'm not Democrat, I'm not Republican, I'm Canadian, I, don't, I, I, I really don't care about the election. But here is, here is the story. It is in my first time that I counter a government, American government, an American leader, completely anti-Christian and anti-Semitic. It is in my first time that I found an American leader willing to support the bad people that want to kill us. And don't misunderstand me. I have no problem with Obama's color. I'm a brown guy myself, so I don't care if he's black or white. No, because now there is a fashion. If you attack Obama, that's because you hate his color. Well, I'm brown. So I, I, I don't care if the man is black or white. And to be honest with you, he is black as much as much as white. As far as I know, isn't he mixed marriages or something like that? I don't know. Yeah, well, and I don't care about his domestic policies. You need to understand that his domestic policies do not affect me as a human rights organization dealing with the freedom of religion, or does not affect me as a Canadian. So Obamacare, for example, I read about Obamacare. God is my witness. I read about Obamacare seven times. I still don't understand what is Obamacare. I'm not joking. And I would like to believe that I'm an intelligent man. I would like to believe that when I read about something, I understand it. I would like to believe that. Obamacare proved me wrong. I read about Obamacare seven times from different, seven different resources. Some supporters, some opposition, some critical, some... Um, from news, like from articles, from journalists, some from their own website, and I still do not understand what is Obamacare. And I, and I don't think that you do either. I don't think that the American people 100% grasp the idea. I was getting interviewed by, um, what is his name? He's a governor, what is his name? Uh, Huckabee, Mike Huckabee. Uh, are you familiar with his shoes and everything? So I was with him, and I was interviewed by him, and and he said, do you understand, like, the conversation was, do you understand what is about? I told him, I have no idea. I seriously don't. And I'm this kind of man that if I don't, under, if I don't know, I will tell you I don't know, and instead of just saying something, and I don't know what I'm talking about. But it was my, so I don't, Obama's domestic policies will not affect me. I will not judge him uh, on Obamacare because I'm not an American and I don't live here. I will not judge him even on the gun control issues because I don't understand. I still don't understand it. I will not speak about Obama's domestic policies because this is for the Americans to decide. And with my old respect, the Americans decided in the last two elections who they want. So. This is the choice of the American people, and this is the choice that the American people will live with. And the Bible ordered you, ordered you to pray for your leader. 
doesn't mean that you have to be silent on any injustice or corruption. But you have to pray for your leader. But his foreign policy, what made me completely confused about what are we doing here? When American president want to support the rebels in Syria, which is the bad people that want to kill us, when he want to support the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, I am not understanding what are we fighting? Who are we protecting? This is the reality. We're protecting the Muslim Brotherhood, the people that actually founded Al-Qaeda as an organization that killed us in September 11. Are you serious? So I was called in the American Congress in the um, Human Rights Subcommittee of the American Congress, uh, Congressman Chris Smith. And they asked me to testify about Syria. If they give an arm to the rebels or not. So I stand in front of Chris Smith. I told him, Mr. Chair, the Americans have to learn from the past. If we didn't learn from the past, we are determined to repeat it again in the future. So what the past, what the history teach us, the history teach us that we supported Osama bin Laden during the Mujahideen war, during the Afghanistan war with the Soviet. And he turned against us. We supported Saddam Hussein during the Iranian war, the first Arab Gulf war, he turned against us. We supported the rebels in Libya and killed our American ambassador three months later. And what's the definition of insanity? Is repeating the same action, expecting different outcome. And that's what we're facing right now. And what's really bothering me is not President Obama. What re- okay, we understand. He's Democrat. Okay, I got it. Okay. He decided to do it. I'm not all Democrats. I met with many wonderful Democrats people. Hmm. A few. But I need to understand why Senator John McCain is signing with him. I need to tell you something about Senator John McCain. Senator John McCain is an American hero. You say whatever you want to say. Senator John McCain fought for his country, was arrested for his country, was tortured, was a present for his country. And nothing can take this from the history of John McCain. We need to be fair. But can you tell me why John McCain is going with the orders from President Obama to Egypt requesting Muslim Brotherhood leaders to be released from the prison? Why you cooperate with with Obama? It's not your business. Stay stay with the Republican. Are you Republican or Democrat? I don't care if you cross the, 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 the floor or whatever they want to call it. But just call yourself Democrats then. Don't call yourself Republican. But this is the reality. And talking about not only the Christians and the minority in, in, in Christianity. Now, what's happened that, just let's continue the story. So the Egyptian went out and they demonstrated the Muslim Brotherhood, the army took over. And now the American government is threatening by taking away their American aid to Egypt unless they release the Muslim Brotherhood leaders. Okay. But there is another side of the story that we have to speak about, which is Israel. 
Now, this Muslim extremist will not be only dangerous for Israel, uh, so for, the, for the Christians, which they are destroying every single church and killing every single Christian. I was sharing with my brother and sister there that we are right now building field hospitals in Egypt and in Syria, basically to help the people on the ground. Instead of giving them weapons, let's give them medication. That's what they need right now. Now, on the border of, of Israel, you need to understand that Israel now more than ever is surrounded by Muslim extremists. So you have from Syria, from Egypt, in the last year, when Muslim Brotherhood took over, 15 attacks on the, on the Israeli border from Egypt, which didn't happen in the last 33 years. 15 attacks. Can you imagine the number? So the state of Israel today is facing danger more than any other time. Jerusalem, our holy land, our holy city, is in danger because this Muslim extremist. And you need to understand that today there is different face for anti-Semitism. Well, hear me, hear me out. In the old days, there was... Um, old face for anti-Semitism. So the old anti-Semitism was what? The old anti-Semitism was hate the Jews, kill the Jews. That was the old anti-Semitism. Now there is new different kind of anti-Semitism that wearing masks. It's not about the Jews, it's about Israel. So instead of attacking the Jewish people, it's attacking Israel as a country. Why? Because it's more politically correct. So if you take the speeches of Hitler that was talking about the Jews all over it, if you take the word Jews and you put Israel, it's the same speeches that you are hearing today. But this is the new kind of anti-Semitism that we are facing. If this is mean that we don't have the right to criticize Israel, of course you can to criticize Israel. Israel is a state like any state. And Jewish people, like any Jewish people, they are not angels, they are not devils, they are human beings. So, of course, you can criticize Israel. But two things you cannot touch when it comes to Israel. Two things. Number one, Israel right to exist. Number two, Israel right to defend itself. This is the only two things. You can criticize Israel. But, by the way, there is nobody criticizes Israel more than the Israelis. Trust me on this one. And I speak Hebrew and I go there and I know exactly what they're saying. And the unity among our Christian community and our Jewish community today is more important than ever because we have to unite it against this extreme danger that we are facing we have to unite it so what's the solution unity is extremely important among the Christian and the Jewish community and I just was meeting with the Israeli ambassador a few days ago, and this is something that we have to build together. But the unity is very hard. Among the, there is barriers. There is one barrier from the Jewish side, and there is one barrier from the Christian side to unite it with the Jewish people, the, the Christians and Jews together to unite it. There is two barriers, one from the Christian side, one from the Jewish side. Let's talk about the Jewish side first. The Jewish side, they always care that we'll convert them. So they believe that Christians will love them just to convert them. I have, um, I have a story to tell you. Always when, you know, when I sit down with a Jewish rabbi or something, he said, Majid, the reason that we are scared of you guys is that you always try to convert us. And I tell him, Rabbi, I want to share with you a story. I live in downtown Toronto, in Canada, and across the border from New York. And I live downtown Toronto, and Jehovah Witness used to come knock on my door every Saturday. They used to. I don't know why they don't anymore. I have four Jehovah Witnesses in the closet. I don't know what to do with them. But anyway, that's another <laughs> thing. The 
the Jehovah Witnesses used to come knocking on my door, but I, they never scared me. I was smiling on their face. I tell them, come in, let's have a cup of coffee together. Once they come in, I lock the door, they can't leave, but that's another story. <laughs> I tell them, nobody can force you to convert. Nobody can force you to convert. If you listen to our message, if you listen to who we are and you want to believe, that's not forcing to convert you. Nobody can convert you. So get over it. Even if the Christians want to convert you, so what? Nobody will force you. You like it, you like it. You don't like it and you want to remain who you are, you remain who you are. Nobody will force you. Why are you so scared? This is number one. Number two, I always tell him, Rabbi, I used to be a Muslim. I used to hate Israel. I used to hate the Jewish people. Let me tell you about the story about this little boy that learned to hate Israel, you know, from the media, from the school, from his teachers, from the people in the street. And I'm standing in front of you right now, one of the biggest defenders of Israel, because of what? Jesus Christ. This is it. Two reasons, one reason, two words. Jesus Christ. So don't be scared of the Lord that changed my heart. There was, they tell you there was, uh, um, there was old story. They tell you three religious group of people. They sit down together, have a debate. One was Catholic priest, one was a, a, a Baptist pastor, and one was Jewish rabbi. Had a debate with each other, who would go to the woods, bring a bear, and convert the bear to his religion. So the Catholic priest went to the woods. One hour, two hours, three hours. He came back with a bear. The bear went down on his knees. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. You are forgiven, child. The Baptist go to the woods. One hour, three hours, five hours, six hours. He come back with a bear and he start to baptize the bear. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Jewish rabbi go to the woods. Five hours, six hours, seven hours, nine hours, fifteen hours. He come back, all cuts, all bruises. Rabbi, what's happened to you? He said, Oi, I shouldn't start with circumcision. But then... And there is the Christian barrier. Did you hear this expression before? It's called uh, replacement theology. Did you hear about this before? Do you know what is replacement theology? Replacement theology in our churches, what a lot of people believe, or what a lot of pastors believe, that the promises in the Old Testament to Israel been taken away and given to the church. Do you know what I'm talking about at all? It's called replacement theology. So many of the Christian leaders believe that all the promises in the Old Testament been taken, like was given to Israel, now is belong to the church, does not belong to Israel anymore. Is a is a very well known theology, and anti-Semitism is life and well in some of our churches because of it. And one of the major leaders that believe in this, uh, by the name of uh, United Church, and I sat down with some of their pastors or some of their leaders without mentioning names, and a very polite man and normally, normally yes, and I sat down with them and. I let them speak, like I let them to express their feeling, what is the replacement theology in their eye and their heart and and I learned to listen I'm a, I'm a lawyer by education, so I, I learned to listen first and after that speak, so I listen, I let them download and in the end after they finishes everything, I told them I have a question for you if God will change his promises in the Old Testament how you know that he will keep his promises in the new? 
How do you know that after we die, we go to heaven and God will say, oh, there is no salvation, I was just kidding. God said in the Bible, I am God and I do not change. That's what God said. The unity among our communities, the, the unity among us as Christians, is the way to fight this war. We don't fight hate by hate or revenge by revenge or evil by evil. We fight hate by love, revenge by forgiveness, and evil by the power of the living God. When we build our first field hospital in Egypt, some of our team contacted me, the, some of the people on the ground contacted me. They told me, what we do if a Muslim came and he was hurt or wounded, do we treat him or not? And I told him, you have to treat him, even if he was a police officer. Even if he was the one who just killed your brother in front of you, you treat him under my hospital. Because that's Christ. I told him, I don't care who will come from the door of this field hospital. If he's Christian, if he's Muslim, is a police officer, if he's a guy with a beard, I don't care who he is. If he needs medical attention, you will give it to him in Jesus' name. Because this is who we are. The Lord was wise enough to understand that there is no society, there is no community can survive an eye by an eye or tooth by tooth or the whole society will end blind and toothless. In this hospitals that we built, we treated more Muslims than Christians. And some of them came to us after that and said, why did you save my life? I was the one that killing you. And this is the testimony and the legacy that we want to leave in their heart. The only way to win this war is through forgiveness and victory in Jesus' name. The only way to win this war is courage. And courage is not the absence of fear. It is the presence of fear, yet the will to go on. That's courage. People of God, in the end, I thank you for the opportunity to be here with you and to share with you this morning about the situation that's happening around the world. But in the end, my message always clear and loud. The persecuted Christians is dying, but they're still smiling. They are in very deep, dark night, but they still have the candle of the living God. Our enemy have very strong army, it's true. Our enemy have very strong weapon, it's true. But we have the Lord Almighty, and this is a fact. They can kill the believers, but they cannot kill the belief in our hearts. They can kill Christianity, but nobody... They can kill Christians, but nobody can kill Christianity. The truth and the reality, that after every night there is new morning carrying new day. After every storm there is sunshine. And after every persecution there is victory in Jesus' name. The truth and the reality... They can always kill the dreamer, but nobody can kill the dream. Thank you, and God bless, and the fight carry on.